All right, welcome back. And in this video, we're gonna cover the second part of chapter five from the Rathus introductory text. In the previous video, we introduced the concept of learning, uh, looked at it sort of from a learning perspective or behaviors perspective and from a cognitive perspective. And uh, then we introduced the idea of classical conditioning, um, you know, and, and talked about Pavlov and his dogs as an example that probably many of you have heard about before even taking this course. Um, but again, I want to remind you that the focus of, of, of classical conditioning is primarily on unlearned, uh, involuntary sort of reflexive and instinctive behaviors. And so we're going to switch gears today and, and or today for this video, excuse me, and look at more voluntary behaviors, uh, things that we learn that are shaped uh, by operant conditioning. So in this video today, we're going to cover operant conditioning and operant conditioning as a form of learning originates from Edward Thorndike's law of effect. Um, and the, the law of effect simply says that, you know, responses, if a response is rewarded, um, it's more likely to be strengthened. Uh, whereas if a response is met with punishment, then it's more likely to stop. It's more likely to be stamped out. And this is one of the ways that we learn. So when certain behaviors of ours are rewarded, we're more likely to persist and continue doing those things. But if somebody punishes us for our behavior, we're more likely to discontinue. Now, obviously, we can think of examples to where that, that isn't true. We can think of people who, once they're punished, they seem to act out more. But this is just sort of a, a general rule of thumb when we're thinking about behavior. It's obviously not applicable 100% of the time, all the time. But, um, you know, for the most part, this is typically how people respond. And this is where B.F. Skinner comes in. B.F. Skinner followed in the footsteps of Thorndike, and he kind of took this idea of the, the law of effect from Thorndike and modeled it into a new theory called operant conditioning. And he, you know, most of the theory of his theory comes from his work with, with, with non-humans, specifically with pigeons. Um, you know, he, he, was, he was using this idea to teach them operant behavior, or behavior that operates or manipulates the environment. Um, to learn behaviors that are reinforced. And when I say reinforced, that's a fancy way of saying rewarded. It's not always rewarded, like you get a prize. I mean, it could be, it doesn't always have to be something like that, but it's reinforced. So anytime you see that word reinforced or reinforcement, it's meant for, uh, it's meant to encourage behavior to continue. Um, so we're really looking at voluntary responses of behavior that are acquired or conditioned through reinforcement. And that's what the big focus for operant conditioning is. Um, Skinner was focused on primarily measurable behaviors. He did not care at all for things that were going on between our ears, you know, especially with his animals. He wasn't trying to measure what's going on in their mind. He was interested in measuring their behaviors, observing behaviors directly. And so he created these things called Skinner boxes um, where you would put an animal like a pigeon or a rat inside and, um, and it allowed you to sort of control and manipulate the environment. Like you could decide how often the rat gets food or the pigeon gets food, things like that. Um, here's a picture of a, a Skinner box. You know, this is the food, but you have, you have a food dispenser, water, you have a light and a screen here so you can see the rat and this lever here. And, you know, the behavior oftentimes in this example, Skinner would want the rat to push on the lever to get the food pellet to come out and teach the rat, hey, when you push on this food pellet, it's time you'll get food. Um, so, or you can teach the rat, for example, hey, you got to push on this thing five times in order for it to get food. Like the rat will figure it out pretty quickly if it's hungry enough. The motivation kicks in and they'll figure it out. So truth or fiction, during World War II, uh, B.F. Skinner proposed that pigeons be trained to guide missiles to their targets. Pause the video. What do you think? Welcome back. It is, in fact, true. That was one of the first sort of applications of his uh, principles of operant conditioning was using this in wartime. Uh, really fascinating stuff. Okay, so there are types of reinforcers. Uh, we'll talk about there's positive and negative reinforcers, immediate versus delayed, and primary and secondary. So we'll take a look at these um, individually, but positive and negative, you see those words and your first initial reaction is good and bad. But in psychology, when we see positive and negative, oftentimes it has nothing to do with good or bad. It's not a value judgment. It is in terms of addition and subtraction. So if we break this down, if we look at this and say, okay, reinforcement is meant to encourage behavior. Positive reinforcement means I'm going to add something or give you something to reinforce your behavior. So, you know, maybe maybe uh, when in high school or in grade school or wherever, your parents gave you money for good grades. They want to encourage you to keep getting good grades. That would be an example of positive reinforcement. 
The goal is to encourage the behavior, keep it going. Negative reinforcement is I'm going to take something away to encourage your behavior. So again, you know, uh, the example of school, maybe after getting good grades, maybe instead of money, your parents say, hey, we're going to take away some of your chores that you normally do. You know, you got a good grade on your math test today, so you don't have to come home and mow the yard. You know, your dad or your, your brother will mow the yard instead, you know, because you did so good in school. We're taking something away to encourage your behavior. Some people really confuse negative reinforcement for punishment. That is not the same thing. Punishment is meant to discourage behavior, and positive and negative have nothing to do with good or bad. So that's one of the first things I have to tell you. You know, Get that out of your mind when you're thinking about uh, psychology. And there's also immediate versus delayed reinforcement. Do you get, you know, do you get your reinforcement like the, you know, your money or your reward or your high five or whatever? Do you get it immediately or is it delayed? You know, oftentimes like things with like our paychecks, you know, we, we work for a week or two weeks or a whole month and get a paycheck, you know, two weeks later, a month later. That's an example of delayed reinforcement. And there's also primary and secondary reinforcers. Um, Primary reinforcers are things that satisfy oftentimes our basic biological needs like food, sleep, sex, things like that. You know, the, ba the basic needs of humans. Secondary reinforcers are things that allow us to acquire primary reinforcers. So if somebody gives you money, pays you money for your job, you know, that's a secondary reinforcer that you use to go, say, pay your rent and buy food. You know, those are meeting those primary reinforcers of, you know, shelter and food. So again, um, I can't stress this enough, positive reinforcement is meant to increase the likelihood of a behavior continuing when something is applied, whereas negative reinforcement, again, is still increasing the probability of behavior, but something is removed. Think about, think about parents taking away their kids' chores. You know, hey, you did a great job today. Just come home and relax. Don't worry about, you know, you studied so hard the last week. You worked hard. Don't worry about it. Here's an example, here's some more examples. So you positive reinforcement, you study. This is the behavior, you're studying. Your reinforcement is, hey, your teacher gives you approval. Hey, good job, you're studying, you're doing really well. Uh, I've noticed that you're putting in more work and that, that positive feedback that you get from your teacher increases the likelihood of you continuing that behavior. Negative reinforcement, same behavior, studying. The negative reinforcer, uh, the teacher disapproval, you know, before when you weren't studying, the teacher would kind of give you a, uh, would, you know, gripe at you or maybe give you some side eyes or, you know, give you all kinds of grief for it. But hey, now that you're studying, that grief is removed. It's gone. That's the negative reinforcement. And this, of course, increases the likelihood of studying. Hey, as long as I keep studying, my teacher will get off my back. If I keep putting in the work, my teacher will stay off my back. So immediate and delayed. We've kind of already talked about that. Um, you know, we oftentimes, we live in an immediate gratif gratification society where we prefer things to happen in the short term. We prefer to have incentives happen now rather than later. Um, so obviously, I think, you know, it, it's going to be a little more powerful. You could, you could use immediate reinforcement. It's oftentimes more effective uh, immediate when you provide reinforcement immediately rather than delayed. Primary and secondary, kind of already talked about this. You know, primary is just the the... Basic needs we have, secondary, are things that we can use to, to acquire those basic needs. Uh, extinction exists as well. I mean, think about your own experience. You know, if, if you're... Oh, computer kind of froze up. Sorry, folks. Um, that's weird. There it goes. Um, think about your own self. You know, if you... If your uh, job, you know, if they just stop paying you all of a sudden, you probably stop showing up. You, you would stop performing the behaviors that they require of you as your job. Um, you know, if you don't get that behavior, if your behavior is not being reinforced, you know, um, you kind of start to wonder what the heck is the point? Um, you know, we can, re we can reinforce ourselves. Obviously there is sort of this idea of intrinsic motivation of being able to motivate ourselves, but oftentimes, especially with things that we don't like to do, we really do rely on external motivation. Like, Hey, somebody paying me to be here. You know, most, most people's jobs, at least early on in life, we don't, you know, we're not just gung ho about working at the fast food restaurant or, you know, working our serving job or wherever, you know, oftentimes it's, Hey, it's that money, it's that incentive. And as soon as that's gone, sorry, uh, you know, but there's also the possibility of spontaneous recovery. As soon as reinforcement is introduced again, behavior comes back. So a lot of these same concepts from classical conditioning are showing up again here. So reinforcement. Now we're going to talk about reinforcement versus punishment. Again, reinforcement is used to encourage behavior. 
Um, and oftentimes, you know, you can kind of tell the difference between how it feels. You know, we typically feel good after we're reinforced and we give, we're given some kind of reward. Whereas punishment, if it's, if it's done right, we tend to feel bad. We don't feel good about it. We feel like, hey, we got to change our behavior or make up for our mistakes. Uh, reinforcement increases the likelihood of a behavior that's being uh, to continue. However, punishment decreases the likelihood of a behavior happening and possibly suppressing undesirable behaviors. So reinforcement increases. Punishment is meant to decrease. So here's an example. Here's negative reinforcement. The, the behavior is studying. Remember, if I study enough, my teacher will leave me alone, will stop, will stop nagging at me. Uh, this is not punishment. This is not punishment. The study, you know, the reinforcement, this, something is being taken away to increase the likelihood of this behavior to continuing, uh, of studying. Uh, punishment, on the other hand, let's say you're talking in class and your teacher gives you detention. Hey, you got to come after school and sit after school. You have detention now. That is the, the idea is to decrease the likelihood of you talking in class. It, it should decrease, ideally. So, and it's, I know it's, it's kind of weird to say this, but there's also positive and negative punishment. Um, positive and negative punishment. Sometimes it's, 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 sometimes it's referred to as type one and type two because that's a little less confusing, but positive punishment means I'm going to apply something that you don't like to get you to stop your behavior. So think about the child in the, in the, in the restaurant or in Walmart or where, who, wherever who throws a tantrum and the parent just starts spanking them on the spot. You know, that is applying something aversive, a spanking, a SWAT. I'm not encouraging you to do that, by the way. I'm just saying that's just an example we've probably all encountered or seen at some point in our lives. Um, this is applying something aversive to get you to stop a behavior. Negative punishment means I'm going to take away something that you like to get you to stop a behavior. If you've ever been grounded before, if you've ever had your cell phone taken away, if you've ever had privileges taken away, uh, if you've ever been arrested or known someone who's been arrested, I mean, that's exactly what that is. Negative punishment. We're going to take away your freedom so you do not break the law anymore. So we see this in all levels, not just in parenting, but also in a larger society. We use punishment quite a bit to curtail undesirable behaviors. Um, again, sort of some of these ideas that are popping up again from classical conditioning is discrimination or discriminative stimuli. You know, we can tell, we, you know, we, we should be able to tell the difference between behaviors that are reinforced and behaviors that are not, um, you know, and the, the textbook gives an, a, an interesting example of when the telephone, you, you know, answer the phone when it rings, you know, you don't answer the phone when it doesn't ring, which seems really silly to say out loud, but that's true. You know, it's not like we're just picking up the phone and going, hello, hello. You know, we wait till it to ring. That's when it, we know that's when it's reinforced. You know, we know, okay, it's time to ring the bell. Um, you know, the same thing at your job, you know, there, you know, there are things that you do or things at school that you do that are going to get, you know, praise from your boss or your teachers. But and you also know there are things that if you do, they're probably not. So you can tell what works and what doesn't. Uh, schedules of reinforcement. Again, this is kind of getting into this idea of delayed versus uh, immediate, but, or are you receiving reinforcement every time, which is, con uh, which is continuous? You know, do you get a high five every time you get it, you do something good at work? Um, uh, or is it more like partial? Maybe it's not every correct response is reinforced. Maybe only every other response is reinforced. Um, and of course, this is more resistant to extinction. If you kind of don't know when reinforcement is going to come, it's less likely to, um, to, to experience extinction. Kind of keeps you on your toes. There's also fixed uh, interval schedules where, you know, you receive reinforcement after so many responses, after so many fixed responses. So, for example, like if you ever go, if you shop at like a coffee shop, I, I know I go to the OU coffee cafe, uh, cafe in the library and for every 10 cups of coffee, you get a free cup of coffee. So it's a fixed interval of, 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 um, of reinforcement, meaning every 10 times you're going to get every this interval. Or I think that's actually ratio. I'm sorry. I'm, I think I'm jumping ahead. Uh, that might actually be ratio. But an interval is a time period. So, you know, you get paid every two weeks. You get, um, like, I get paid once a month. So, you, you know, that's a, that's a fixed interval schedule. I, I know when it's coming, and it's in an interval of time. Sorry, I kind of mixed my examples up. I apologize. Variable interval. This is where it's totally unpredictable. Um, response rates tend to, be, tend to be low but steady. You know, this is, um, you know, this is maybe uh, you're gonna get you're gonna get reinforcement. I think of this as um, I was gonna say a time machine or time machine time a slot machine a time machine like that exists a slot machine. But I think that's again it's more of a ratio schedule. But again the idea is this is much more unpredictable in a variable ratio interval schedule. Excuse me, I'm mixing up my terminology. I'm so sorry. 
Um, it varies after time elapses, but you don't know. It could be every 30 minutes. It could be every hour. You're not quite sure. It, it, it tends to be low, but also more steady and a little less subject to um, a little less subject to extinction. So here's a graph kind of representing this. You can read about it in your text. Let's check uh, comprehension before we move forward. Kelly is scolded each time she teases her little brother. Her mother notices that she that the frequency of teasing has decreased. Scolding Kelly is an effective what? Is it A, a negative reinforcer? Is it B, negative punishment? C, conditioner? Or D, positive conditioner? So um, go ahead and pause the video, write your answer down, come back and we'll talk about it and see what you think. So the first thing we need to know, okay, sorry, welcome back. Uh, the first thing we need to look at is um, what's going on. Is the behavior increasing or decreasing? Well, we see it's decreasing. So we can already eliminate a couple of answers. You know, we can, or at least can eliminate negative reinforcer because remember, reinforcement is meant to increase behavior, whereas we're looking at a situation where behavior is being decreased. So then that leaves us options B, C, or D. Now, I don't quite recall us talking about a conditioner or a positive conditioner. So I hope by process of elimination and by a little bit of understanding about operant conditioning, you're able to tell that actually the correct answer is B, negative punisher, the scolding. Um, you know, well, I say all that. Yeah, it's the scolding. So, and I'm kind of looking at this now. You can make a case that maybe this is actually positive punishment. Maybe I need to reword this, but it's definitely punishment either way. As I'm thinking about this out loud, Sorry, you're watching the teaching magic happen on, at right in the moment. Sorry about that. I should have fixed this before the video, but we're kind of all learning on the fly, and that's all right. Okay, uh, truth or fiction. Slot machine players pop coins into machines more rapidly when they have no idea when they might win. What do you think? True or false? Go ahead and pause the video. Check your comprehension. Okay, welcome back. It is true. Yeah, when when you don't know, and that's that's why Vegas works. That's why casinos are so successful is because people keep pumping their money in because, hey, I might win. I don't know when I'm going to win, but I might win. There's an algorithm that says I'm going to win, at, that this machine will, will pop at some point and win, but, you know, I got to keep playing so I can get that win whenever it comes around, but I have no idea when it's going to be. And that's what kind of hooks people into um, gambling, at least on slot machines. Uh, ratio. Ratio schedules. These are you know, fixed ratio. Um, uh, this is after a number of responses. Um, so maybe instead of, you know, maybe at your job, instead of getting paid monthly or getting paid weekly or however, you instead are paid on the uh, amount of output that you uh, produce. So maybe if you're a salesman, you get paid based on the number of sales, like a ratio of sales. Or, you know, if let's say you produce, you know, you make, you manufacture clothing or manufacture, you know, items in a factory or something and you're paid based on the number of items you create. That would be a fixed ratio where response rates tend to be pretty high. You know, hey, if I get paid to make every, every 20 shirts that I, you know, sew together and make in this factory on this machine, I get paid X amount of dollars. I have a lot of incentive to make as many as I can. If I, obviously if I want to make money to make as much money as possible. Um, there's also variable ratio schedule. This is where um, it's an you know reinforcement is provided, but you know really it's indefinite number of responses. It's not it's not it's very unpredictable. It's incredible. This is slot machines. Um, you know that it, you know the slot machine on average is supposed to maybe hit uh, every 50 times, but that's an average. You know it could hit on the first time, and then it may wait another another 250 pulls and then all of a sudden there's like two or three you know uh in a row so it's very much uh, unpredictable and this is again what kind of keeps people hooked on playing slot machines and other games like that uh applications you know you see by it's in biofeedback training which we talked about in chapter four hey i've been doing this thing where i notice my heart rate is going down and i feel good i feel better i feel like more energized etc cetera, etc cetera. That's very reinforcing to keep doing this. It's reinforcing to kind of help yourself. Any kind of behavior modification program is going to include op elements of operant conditioning. Anytime you're trying to shape someone's behavior, especially if you're teaching complex behaviors, where you're teaching, you know, small steps towards big, you know, big behavior changes, you're going to use elements of operant conditioning. So let's take a look at shaping. If you've ever wondered how, like, if you go to the circus and you see animals, like, in the circus doing really... Com, you know, really interesting things like, you know, getting the lion to hold his mouth open while the guy puts his head in or getting animals to jump through hoops and et cetera, getting the elephant to stand on its foot. 
these are not behaviors that these animals know instinctively. They have to be taught, and they have to be taught in a series of steps um, where each step is reinforced towards this bigger overall goal of, 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 of a larger behavior. And this is called shaping, where you're kind of teaching and reinforcing uh, each, each step along the way as it gets closer and closer to, to the desired behavior. Okay, uh, truth or fiction. You can train a rat to climb a ramp, cross a bridge, climb a ladder, pedal a toy car, and do several other tasks all in a proper sequence. Uh, pause the video, come back, what do you think? All right, welcome back. It is true, reinforcement. This is a lot of the stuff that Skinner did. We can teach rats, pigeons, all kinds of interesting behaviors as long as we use reinforcement. Uh, you have to make the mistakes in order to learn. What do you think, true or false? Oh, sorry, I gave the answer away. It is true, that's one of the easiest ways we learn. It's through mistakes, those excessive approximations as we get closer and closer. You know, don't think of your mistakes as failures. Think of your mistakes as just one step, albeit maybe a small step, but you're getting closer and closer to the desired outcome. Okay, we're gonna stop here. I feel like I just threw a lot at you with operant conditioning. I think our next video will wrap up chapter five of the Rathis text, so uh, be, be uh, on the lookout for that. I'll probably record that here pretty soon. But otherwise, uh, good luck with the rest of chapter five. I'll see you on the next video.